What is up, booktube? It is Monty, and today I am back again, once again, to talk to you guys about some books. And today, the day has finally arrived. We are going to discuss the worst books that I have read in the year 2021. It's a new year. It's a fresh start. We are going to put <laughs> these books behind us. We are going to move on and hopefully, hopefully have a much better reading year this year than we have in the past. This list does not have a disclaimer. All of these books are books that I did not enjoy. If you enjoyed them, I'm kind of questioning your taste a little bit. It's just that I feel like that's just, that's normal. The list itself is not in any particular order. I did sit down and I was like, let me try and order these. I'm not gonna do that. I think I'm gonna take a page out of Erin's book where she had her little list and she was like, what haven't I talked about? Obviously I'm going to save the books that I found, you know, the most egregious for last kind of like build suspense but if it's on this list then I didn't like it I just didn't I don't own any of these books physically anymore because I got rid of them because I thought they were the worst books I read this year so editing Monty is gonna have a hell of a time throwing up some pictures I hope you guys have a beverage I just woke up so I have some coffee it's disgusting but I can only blame myself it's okay. Last year I did my worst list. I had this disgusting green juice. This year I have not so good coffee. It fits the vibe of the video. Anyway, without further ado, let's get started. The first book I want to talk about is Iron Widow by Shirin J. Zhao because everybody and their mother has been loving this book. I've seen this book on many a number one, you know, top 10 book of the year. It was a New York Times bestseller. I think it's going on like three months now. Everybody in this mother loves this book. In Defense of Iron Widow, this is not a book that I think I would have gravitated toward if not for the hype. So I read it for the hype. I had an arc of it. I think it was a read now on NetGalley for a hot minute there. So I grabbed it because again, everybody and their mother was talking about it. And I don't think this is the book everybody thinks that it is. And I was, this is more borderlining into disappointing because I do follow Sheer and Jay Zhao's YouTube account. I love their YouTube. I think they make great videos. And I watched their, I think it was a two-part series they did on the actual historical figure of Wu Zetian because I am a silly American who had never heard of her. She has been popping up a lot in uh, Chinese-focused books. I think Eris Apparently by Diana Ma, like that's kind of like a contemporary take where our main character is like a direct descendant of Wu Zetian. So again, like she's been popping up a lot of places, but I, I didn't know who she was. So I watched it and the person that Wu Zetian was or the person that, you know, history recorded her to be is fascinating. So then I read Iron Widow and I don't see any of that person in the, in the character that Sharon J. Zhao wrote. Like, I don't, I don't see it at all. I also think the world doesn't make sense for the entirety of that first book. I will say that when you get to the end and you get, to, I think, I don't know if it's an epilogue or it's like the last chapter, the world like clicks into place and like all of the questions that I thought were like not being answered finally got answered. But at that point it was too late. It was too late. And I said, you know, you, you, I'm not, I'm not falling for this. Think of the bad book. Don't recommend it to people. Almost immediately, our character of Wu Zetian is like introduced as, you know, the best of the best. Nothing, anything that anybody else can do can like actually harm her. And so when you have to see her go into battle a couple more times throughout the course of the novel, there's no tension there. There was never any tension in the novel. And so all the attempts to like create tension I thought were stupid. And then again, there were so many questions about the world that didn't make any fucking sense that by the time we got those answers, I was like, peace out. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation. I won't be returning. Coming in at number seven, I think there are eight books on this list, but the next worst book that I read is along the similar lines. And that is Black Sun by Bere uh, Rebecca Roanhorse. Again, this is a booktube loved darling. And I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't see it. Here's the thing. I think that the world that the that Roan Horse was able to craft is immaculate. I have never read a book set in, you know, pre-Columbus America. I think that it was a fascinating time. I think that it was really uh, vividly imagined and described and detailed. And all of the cultures that we got to see in the book were rendered beautifully. My issue with the book is that it's set over 20 days. And we know this when the book opens, 
because each chapter heading gives us a countdown. There is a ticking clock mechanism built into the book. And so for half of the book, half of this book is set over two days. And the last half of the book, we're fucking Tomb Raider in this bitch. Speed running. Like we need to break some world record to get to the actual events of the eclipse. And not for me. Not for me. I'm sorry. I don't do that. I don't fuck with that. Y'all know that pacing is something that, especially time skips, are something that I am very, like, that is my one pet peeve. Throughout <laughs> books, you have to, like, really convince me that these time jumps are necessary and vital to the plot um, in order for me to believe it. And while I do believe that it was important, I did not think that it was well handled. I also did not like Naranpa. Naranpa, I think she was the sun priestess, the sun priest. She was, you know, the divine religious figurehead of the, the colony that we were in. Maybe colony is not a great word when we're discussing a pre-Columbus America. But of the setting that we were in, she was definitely a religious leader. She was supposed to be having all of this respect. But because she had like literally come from the bottom of the plateau and clawed her way to the top, both metaphorically and literally, she was not respected amongst the others in the order. And I did not appreciate how she had this tenacity to her to literally crawl her way up from the bottom, but was somehow still stupid enough to see people plotting against her and had no moves of her own. There was no, you know, hidden trick up her sleeve. And while I do believe that there are people out there in the universe who get through life solely, let's, let's zoom out a little bit maybe, who get through life solely on luck and good fortune, the good sister Ranpa, I wanted her to have some common sense. I wanted her to have sense that she did not have. And it didn't make sense to me that she could have crawled her way out from the bottom and could not see all these people plotting and scheming and not think to have some plots and schemes of her own. And then she literally, the, the end of the book, she only survives because she didn't have any plots and schemes of her own. The next book I want to talk about, I think, is going to be, let's talk about Daniel Green. Let's talk about Daniel Green. So... If you don't know, back in like March or so, he released a novella, Breach of Peace. I have a nice little quick video where I read Breach of Peace. The book itself was only about 100 pages. Was not a fan. Was not a fan. I gave it two stars. I thought it was okay. I thought it showed promise. I did think that, you know, some of the themes that I did. One, I say this every time I talk about Daniel Green. I do not watch that man's channel. I'm not invested in his community. I don't know what's going on over there. I don't know if he details his writing process. If he gives like little Q&As, little update moments. I don't see it. I'm not a subscriber. I don't follow him. If Aaron hadn't told me this man was going to be releasing a book, I would have never known this man was going to be releasing a book. It's like that, right? So I have watched his discussion on uh, his response to some reviews, which I think is a little bit weird, but I understand like why he made that video. Ultimately, the the whole world building that he gives us in Breach of Peace is about police brutality and how these these, you know, investigative units in his world are like above everybody, but how that doesn't mean that he himself is pro-police um, and that his police are actually different. And I think that the only criticism that I have of Daniel Green is how he wrote his police and how he thinks that police in our everyday life actually function. Because I think that he thinks that they are separate and different and there is no overlap between what he wrote and reality. And I would just, I would get, I would just like to tell him um, sir, you were, you were wrong. You're wrong. Now, I'm not going to say that Daniel Green actually believes that police should be able to go out here and, like, shoot people in the face and get, like, have nothing happen to them. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that the police that he wrote are essentially just, like, modern policery. So, take that. And I will say, like I did in my Rebels Creed... My Rebels, because these, these things are linked, I think. The first book was okay, but it's because of the existence of book two that he's on this list. Because book two got rid of all of the world building that Breach of Peace did. I think in part because the, the way that people talked about how he wrote the police was so strong that I think that when he got around to editing novellas two and three to make them a, like a bind up one book situation... I feel like he took the criticism and went a little bit too far with it because suddenly there was no world building and what little of the world we had known didn't quite make as much sense. And while it's true that we're following kind of the rebellion in Rebels Creed, because I mean, it's called Rebels Creed, 
I'm not going to spoil anything here. I, like I said, I have that whole video. I'll leave it linked up above. But like the, the rebellion didn't make sense. And instead we kind of got this plot where the empire was like going to chase down some people who had fled the continent that were being described as primitive in the new world again. So, and then <laughs> the first half of that novella collection was about Chapman and cultural appropriation and uh, cultural erasure and again even genocide and those are just topics that are ubiquitous in, a, in, in, in you know adult high fantasy adult fantasy in general but um not sure Daniel Green is the messenger that I would have chosen for those themes and again the book was bland it was horrible don't the first book Reach of Peace I think is fine and while the second book you know, Rebels Creed reads very similarly to Breach of Peace. They're both easy to get into. I don't think that your life will be enriched by having read them. And I just can't recommend them. I hope he stopped writing books. I, I hope that he continues his calling and running his successful YouTube channel and leaves book writing to somebody else. Next, I want to talk about my girl Firefly Lane. I have, I have ranted to the patrons about this book. I talked about it a little bit in a in a wrap up i talked about it in an unhaul video i don't know if i've actually spoiled this book for you guys so i'm going to now i read this like i said for my patrons they voted on it i owned it i was excited to read it here we follow uh kate malarkey and Tallulah hart these are two women who met in the like 70s i want to say maybe the 60s it was you know a couple decades ago and they met as children. They were like mm, 13, 14 years old because Tallulah's mom came and picked her up one day and they moved in next to Kate Malarkey. And they were friends and they went to college together and they went to high school together. And then they got their first job at the same news station because Tallulah's entire life goal was to be a reporter on the news. Like that was her thing. She was gonna do that. And Kate Malarkey had no passions, ambitions, life of her own. Kate Malarkey eventually got married to the producer at the morning station that they worked at. This is the same man who had previously slept with Tallulah Hart. And then Kate essentially becomes a stay-at-home mom who literally does nothing and she's a stay-at-home mom, which, you know, I love for her. And Tallulah goes on to like be a news reporter who is, you know, at every major newsworthy event from 1980 to the early 2000s when she eventually gets her own Oprah-like talk show in the Seattle area. Love that for her. Um, and like I said, Kate Malarkey is a stay-at-home mom who eventually has, you know, some children, so she can actually be a mom. And her older daughter and Tallulah have a very close relationship because mothers and daughters fight sometimes, and sometimes when that happens, the daughter goes to see Tully Hart, and Tully Hart acts as though this child is hers. She'd be making plans for this child. She'd be doing things for this child without ever consulting, you know, this child's actual parents, which I think is a little strange. Don't think that's okay. I think most parents would have an issue with that, but Tallulah and in her infinite wisdom disagrees, I guess. And so one day Tallulah decides she's going to bring Kate Malarkey onto her, onto her radio show. Because mind you, this whole book is supposed to be about... We know at the beginning of the book, before we even learn that they're friends, that they had this massive falling out and like maybe they're going to come back together. We find out that the the daughter wants to bring her mom, Miss Kate Malarkey, onto Tallulah's nationally syndicated talk show. And the topic of this show is Kate is an abusive mom because she wouldn't let her 16 year old daughter go to a concert with her best friend. That's the abuse that Kate Malarkey has done to her 16 year old daughter. And so Tallulah, who has known this woman for over three decades, goes in and says that Kate has issues, that she is an abusive person, that she is the worst mom in America. And I said, this is what y'all supposed to come back from? And readers, it gets worse. Not only does it, <laughs> is this the abuse, this is the worst mom, and then Kate Malarkey develops cancer that metastasizes into her brain. And she calls up to Lula Hart. This is what's going to reconcile them. And she says, I need you to raise my children. I need you to fuck my husband. I need you to be there because I'm dying. And then the bitch dies. And there's a sequel to this book called, I think it's like Fly Away. 
And I'm like, there is no way in hell you could pay me to read about Tallulah Hart raising them girls after this woman done called you a horrible mother for literally no reason. For literally being like, hey, you're not my kid's actual parent. Like maybe loop me in before you promise them shit. So needless to say, I won't be reading any more Kristen Hanna books. I don't know what kind of hole she got on them, you know, historical girlies. I mean, it was easy to read, but like still, I don't know what the hole she has on the historical girlies, but they need to let her go. Next is a book that I, I thoroughly despised, and that is Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. I think this won a Goodreads Choice Award, and I'm still a little, conf I'm, I'm confuddled, very confuddled about that. So here we are following, I don't even remember the bitch's name, but she is a final girl. And we start off with her and her therapy session, the Final Girl Support Group, where her and I think it's like three other people who have survived, you know, mass casualty events. They were, you know, the last girl standing. They're in therapy and um, they're like, oh, okay, well, it was me. After this therapy session, we find out that the very first final girl, at least in the universe that this is, you know, based on, Adrian was murdered at the summer camp that she opened to help survivors of mass casualty events and like give them a fun summer. This is the camp that she herself survived at, you know, and the man like it looked like he escaped and murdered her. I think this is this is the plot of this one. And I said, OK, interesting. Now, mind you, Adrian is a black woman. Grady Hendrix made his first final girl, a black woman. She's not the only character of color in the book, but she is the only black final girl. And so our main character who is uber paranoid is like, they're coming for us. They're coming for us. Like this is, I knew this was going to happen one day. She lives in the most fortified apartment I've ever heard of. Um, I believe someone tries to attack her in the apartment. The police show up at her apartment and she escapes. She runs to her therapist's house where she eventually goes on the run with the therapist's son, I want to say. And like maybe his girlfriend is also there. And they go see, I think there's like a Latinx final girl. And it was really interesting because this was taking place in Southern California. And so like there were times where they were like driving out to the high desert. And I was like, oh my goodness, I know where you guys are going. Like I can, I can actually imagine this. I know, I know that stretch of the highway. So like that was fun. But otherwise I was like, this is stupid. Like this is actual tomfoolery. And now to spoil the book. Because the book ends with the revelation that the therapist's son, girlfriend, the son and the girlfriend were the ones trying to kill off the final girls because the therapist was, you know, spending her entire life trying to figure out these final girls and like was neglecting her children. And the girlfriend was like, oh, they're nothing special. I'll show you special. Y'all are weak. And mind you, the only final girl that actually dies throughout the entire book is the black one. All the other final girls get to live. But Adrian does make one final appearance to our main character in the third act. She appears as a hallucination, the magical Negro hallucination to tell our main character to keep going, to keep fighting, that she can do it. And when that happened, I was done. I was done. I checked this book out from the library. No, I purchased this. I had bought this book because everybody and their mother said that Grady Hendrix, he was the one to watch. He was, you know, the best author of a generation. Okay, they didn't say all that, but they were like, this is, you know, an author to watch. This is his new release. Clearly, I can't go wrong starting here. I also did want to check it out because of the kerfuffle that Riley Sager, because, you know, he tweeted and deleted. He said, I think it was on the day that, you know, Final Girl Support Group came out that, like, you know, some shady shit about the titles and the and the, and the the situation of the book because he wrote Final Girls. And I want to say that Final Girls was a better book. And if I were Riley Sager, I would have subtweeted too. I would not have deleted because not only was Final Girls a better book, it, there was no magical support in New York in the third act. I think that the third act of Final Girls, well, it's not the best book I've ever read. I think I, I gave Final Girls three stars but it was solid it was a solid premise you know it's very similar setup but there was no magical support negro there was no random you know little 20 year old killer and what killed me about the girlfriend being in on it was she ends the book in the final girl support group she kills the one black member and she gets to just sit in the group and i said if you don't move your little white ass out of here i don't know what to tell you because bitch you don't belong you don't go here but she got to sit in the group and the black girl was dead. Okay. 
Okay. I think I think the time has come for me to talk about the two books that I'm putting together on this list in one entry. The two books I think everybody has seen coming, and that is The Silent Patient and The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. Now, here's the thing. I have reviews of both of these. The Maidens is in a week-long reading vlog, and my Silent Patient review is a standalone video where I say that Alex needs to be stopped. And I think that I want to spend this time briefly addressing the criticism that I have received in criticizing both of these texts. Namely, in The Silent Patient, I think that it's very important for us to remember that the narrative wants us to believe that Theo is a good therapist because the plot of the book does not exist if Theo was a bad therapist. Because somebody in my comment section wanted to say that it wasn't fair for me to say that he was a bad therapist because, you know, that's kind of the point. The point is that he is not supposed to be a character that you're rooting for, but so you can see it's obviously flawed. And I would disagree. The point of the book is that he gets to become, I think her name is, I don't even remember what the fuck the bitch's name is. It starts with an A, I'm the lady, okay? He gets to treat the silent patient because of how good he is. He gets to solely focus on being her doctor because of how good he is. He's able to convince the people at the Grove to be her therapist, to do what no one else can do because he is such a good therapist. And if he was supposed to be a bad therapist, we would not believe that he is convincing all of these people that he can do the impossible. So I don't agree with that argument. I also don't believe that the book is structured very well. Like, it's structured better than The Maidens, which absolutely doesn't make any sense. Mariana going to Cambridge to soothe her niece? Okay. Mariana seeing this therapist friend that she knows who works with the police and then going, oh, I'm going to do that. And then just, like, lying to people and butting into a police investigation where the police are like, ma'am, please stop. Like... I have to I have to imagine that the English police would have just arrested her ass for interfering in their investigation for clearly like not actually even investigating. She was so convinced from like the the time that this man walked by that the book didn't explore anything. It was marketed as dark academia, which doesn't make any sense because it, I guess because it's set on a college campus, but like we aren't following the student, we aren't following the maidens. I think if we had been following the maidens, it would have been a much more interesting look but I think that Alex Michaelides is so tied to following a therapist like he thinks like that's his his brand his niche is these like unhinged therapists it was foolishness and then the maidens had this stupid plot where there was like a a surprise pedophile and grooming and all of this that and the third it was just and then we we're supposed to believe that Mariana knew that there was a surprise pedophile and she had like always suspected the surprise pedophile it was just god awful there is nothing redeeming about either book i don't think that either of them are worthy to be read and you also just find a new thriller to obsess over I, literally anybody is doing it better than alex michaelides he needs to he needs to hang it up he needs to hang it up the next book is probably what i would have put up as my number one worst read until very recently and maybe recency bias is a thing but i don't think that the further i get from this book is going to get any better so the second to last book i want to talk about today is first to become ashes by cam spara the first time i read a cam spara book he also appeared on my worst of the year list. Docile remains one of the most racist books I have ever had the displeasure of reading. I think Only Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell is a worse depiction of black people that I have ever read. I think, I think. And you know, that might have been even more favorable than Docile. But that's not what we're here to drag. We're here to drag <laughs> First Become Ashes. This was pitched in the most... <laughs> I still remember that tweet that Tor.com sent out. They never tweeted and deleted so fast, but we were supposed to follow a main character. I think his name was like Mockingbird, who was in a cult, who was leaving the cult, and they were supposed to be like kinky sex because that's all Cam Spare writes is kinky sex. And when I say kinky sex, I definitely mean rape because there ain't no kink that happens that is consensual in this book. And I, it's this coupling of rape with kink that just... it unnerves me because it's like you can write this kinky shit and have it be consensual it would be more <laughs> it would just be a better reading experience if the shit was consensual but the cult that our main character is escaping was like they believed that they had magical powers 
And our main character was bonded with this other character. I think his name was Kane. And Kane was finally old enough to go out into the world and battle these monsters that they had been raised in the cult to battle. Now, while they were in the cult, there was a whole bunch of like weird sexual assault going on. There was again pedophilia. There was like forced orgasming and overstimulation and self harm. That was like part of the magic but the sex aspects were like not supposed to be talked about because again one it was rape but two they were never actually supposed to to have orgasms like having an orgasm was going to like dilute your magic unless you were getting raped by the cult leader's friend because the cult leader said that that's what you needed to do so it was very confusing but we eventually you know they leave the cult the, they leave the cult very early on in the book and so most of the book is really about a uh, mockingbird trying to go on this mission because he didn't leave the cult willingly. He kind of got forced out. And then Kane and the FBI are hot on mockingbird's trail, trying to get him back and like, make sure he's safe and doesn't do anything that can harm himself or others. It's, it's a bunch of, it's a, it's, it's, it's horrible. Okay. It's just not good. There's a character in the book who like feeds into mockingbird's delusions, who is not, he is like enabling behavior that is very clearly self-destructive and I thought just weird. And his his behavior is called out by his like podcast co-host. She's like, yo, you're not helping him. Like you're just doing this because you want the shit to be real, but like you're actually hurting him. It's like, that was nice. But so much of the shit that happens in this book, it's not even that like it doesn't get called out, but it's just like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't do anything for anybody. And then I think the part that really made it um, horrible for me is that at the end of the book, there is a sense of maybe the magic is real. Like maybe him being able to like perform magic was real. And maybe all of that self-harming and all of that rape and all, everything that he suffered through was actually real. Like, well, I mean, obviously that stuff was happening to him, but like maybe all of that like also worked to like make his magic happen. And so that part of the book I felt was only included because it was published by Tor.com and Tor.com does like this weird speculative bullshit. It's the same reason I think that Docile gets shelved to sci-fi fantasy, even though it's like, yes, it's near future, but it's like those elements of the book are like not really rooted in science fiction that at any other publisher, it would just be general fiction. And here I felt that those elements were like, sure they existed, but at any other publisher, it would just be shelved over in general fiction. And I felt that it was included just to like put itself in the sci-fi fantasy category when the magic wasn't real, but it wanted to like leave a door open. And I didn't think that it did it very well, wasn't very good. And the only saving grace is unlike Docile, nobody wanted to read First Become Ashes, nobody. And the number one worst book that I read in 2021 has to go to Here's to Us by Becky Albertalli and Adam Silvera. This is the book I struggled to put on this list, but I knew that it had to be here because the book, it's like, I am so confused as to why this was written. Going into the book, I knew that it was going to erase the events of What About Us or What If It's Us by them. It came out a couple years ago. It was my second book that I ever read by Adam Silvera. And it was kind of when I knew that that man was not really going to be the favorite author that I thought he was going to be, that I did not like Becky Albertalli. I don't like the character she writes. I think that they are all just like grading to read they feel like caricatures and not like characters but that's just me people have been eating up her books for a very long time here's to us we follow ben and arthur again we are picking up two years later they are now 18 and 19 respectively um arthur has moved on he's in a new relationship with mario he is you know very happy with mario he has been able to move on from arthur arthur has moved on to this i think it's mikey Mikey and Arthur don't really feel as compatible like them breaking up made sense to me but Mario and Ben have a really interesting dynamic that I just it was Ben was the highlight of the first book and Ben remained the highlight in the second book even though nothing he did made sense so what about what if it's us ends the book after like 300 pages of the of the main couple not being together they decide that they the long distance isn't going to work for them that they have and what, what kills me is like the, the first book in this duology now is them going on repeated first dates because none of the first dates they're going on are actually clicking. They're not actually working. Like both of these men are trying very hard to make this work and it just doesn't seem to be clicking. And so the book ends with them being like, if we couldn't make it work here, 
Like maybe we should just not try and be together. And so here's to us, feels like people were in Adam Silvera's comments, harassing Becky Albertalli, making them write this book where Ben and Arthur just magically get together. And I think this is the first hint that I had that second chance romances just don't work for me because we weren't actually hitting any of the beats of a second chance romance. Like it was 400 pages of Ben going like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But at the same time, like not making any effort to actually be with Arthur. And (laughs) what? Like it didn't make sense to me. And then you had Ben who had like never moved on from Arthur, which made, I mean, you had Arthur who had never moved on from Ben, even though he was with Mikey. And there was a really great conversation that Mikey and Arthur had that I was like, that actually makes sense. Like, that's really great. And it kind of did feel, it kind of felt like, you know, the book is going to end again on them not being together. But I said, that doesn't make sense. Like, there's no reason for them to write a second book and retread the same ground because there's no plot. There's no character development. Even though two years had passed, our characters had not matured. Our characters had not moved beyond their 16, 17 year old selves. And they were still in that same headspace. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. You're in whole new relationships. You are, you know, Ben, not Ben, Arthur was living in a whole new city. Like you had more experience, more time under you. I'm not asking for a lot of character growth, but I am asking that if two years are going to pass, that we are going to see something like we are going to see growth like you should not be the same person that you were two years ago in a book it's it doesn't make sense to me in real life sure maybe but even then I like to think that there's some area like even if you haven't you know wholly like the entirety of your being as a human on this planet hasn't changed I would like to think that at least small aspects of it have and I was not getting that from this book they were the same people and they were going through the same shit that they went through the first time And so when I got to the end, I was just kind of like, I didn't need this to be 400 pages. Like, if this was the story, and the the reason that it felt like um, this was them getting bullied into it, or like they were just going to do it for the cash grab, is that fundamentally, nothing would have changed if you read What If It's Us, and then you just read the epilogue of Here's To Us. Or if you never read What If It's Us and you just read Here's To Us, like you could, again, it's like the same situation where you have like These Violent Delights and Our Violent Ends or Crooked Kingdom and fucking Six of Crows. These are duologies in which the second book in the duology, all of those same things could have happened in their first book. And so, and it's, I feel like it's even almost more egregious in Here's To Us Because this is a contemporary, like there was literally no, nothing new, at least in the fantasy shit. Like there were some things added, like there were, you know, more monsters to fight or, you know, there was miscommunication to overcome. But here it's like literally these characters just living their lives on repeat, like it's fucking Groundhog's Day. And then the book is over and they're, you know, getting married and they're 26 years old. Like... It's just, it was unnecessary. It felt like a cash grab. I'm sure they made a lot of money. There was also a point in the book where Arthur was like, oh, I want to be an author because financial stability. And I was like, I was literally just on, well, (laughs) after I read the book, I was literally on Twitter and Kay Ankrum, who I would argue is a very successful, very well-known author, was tweeting about having to update their resume for the day job. Like... Who is out here? (laughs) Like, people, authors, be on the Bird app, up and down the timeline all day, every day, talking about how being an author solely is very hard. How the pay structure in publishing does not, is not work in their favor. And so seeing the little down on his luck Arthur, talk not Arthur, Ben, talking about, I'm going to be an author so I can be financially stable, so I can help out my family. I'm like, sure, maybe. But I don't know if I would call it financial stability. You're not going to be living your life on no $5,000. So that felt very out of touch. And I don't know if that's the same kind of a line that Adam Silvera at the beginning of his career would write as the Adam Silvera who wrote this book while he was about to launch an NFT ring 
with his other wildly successful YA author friends. Either way, this book was an entire miss for me. I don't recommend it. I feel like you could get the same thing from fan fiction, so you don't need this book. So those are the worst things that I read this year. If you've made it to the end of this video, thank you so much. You can drop this emoji down there. You can tell me what your worst book of the year was, but um, I'm gonna go now. So thanks for watching. I'll see you guys again soon with another video, but until then, and until next time, bye.